Are we ready? 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 What's up, Sound Ninjas? James Attaway here, and I'm coming to you live from my basement. I'm gonna show you today how to set up plugins to use from your computer with your Studio Live Series 3 console using just your console and a USB cable to your computer. It's gonna be awesome. So if you are new here and you haven't, we haven't met yet, my name is James and I help church sound techs make every worship mix an enjoyable one. And so if that's you, go ahead and hit subscribe and ding the little bell to get notified every time I post a new video because it's awesome making church sound great. And if you're the type of person that likes to uh, push the envelope and make sure that things are better than they have been before, go ahead and mash that thumbs up because today we're gonna explore some ways that you can do that with your PreSonus Series 3 Studio Live console and I got that flip-flop, but I'm much better at mixing than I am at speaking. Uh, so go ahead and say hi in the chat if you're with me today. Uh, and make sure my audio is working because sometimes I have problems with audio for video, even though I mix music really good. So, um, the audio is, the video is behind the audio a little bit. So let me, uh, thank you for that. I'm going to go ahead and delay my audio a little bit more. 50 to 100 milliseconds, you're a smart dude. Uh, we're gonna go 400 milliseconds instead of 300. Now, hopefully that is better and you got good sync stuff going on. Uh, the other thing that I stink at is making sure that audio and video are synced uh, with my equipment. And I don't know why that happens. Uh, maybe, we'll, we'll see if this works um, and if this is better now. So let me know if the sync is better, but even if the sync is off, you're gonna learn what you need to learn today. So today we're gonna be taking a look at the console and they make it really easy to insert plugins on your console. You've just gotta do a couple uh, little changes on your board uh, and kind of finagle it in just a little bit to make it work. So let's switch over to the board camera and we will take a look. So, oh shucks. And that broke. Now that broke too. Let's make this work again. There we go. Woohoo! Okay, and we got sunlight coming across it, so we're good to go there. So we've got our Studio Live Series 3 console, and we are starting with our inputs. So uh, on our scene, mo most of the time when you're coming in analog, is you're going to be coming in uh, from the XLR cable in the back and you're going to hit analog as your input. So most of these, although the scene didn't recall it the way that I wanted it to, they should be analog inputs when you're normally coming into your console, right? That's the way that it normally works, right? You've got an XLR cable, it goes into your console and that's your input, that's what you want. But we're going to do things a little bit differently and we're going to switch it to our USB input. So on all of our channels, we're going to hit the USB as our primary input on this channel. We're going to hit the little gear wheel up here. Now, when we hit USB as our channel uh, input, now we have digital send options, which we'll talk about in a second. But our digital send source, we don't want to be digital. We want to be analog. So we're going to go through, and on all these, we're going to switch that from USB and our digital send source to analog. What this does is it sends the signal from the XLR straight to the analog to digital converter. Um, and then it goes all the way over to the computer through the USB cable. So our USB cable is seeing the signal right after the, the preamp and the analog to digital converter. If we wanted our processing to be before it went to the computer, then we would switch that. Uh, let me show you again over here we would send this digital send options from pre to post, right? But we want to have our signal arriving at the computer before we do any processing here. That way we can process it on the way back uh, with our console still, even if we're doing other stuff. Um, this is helpful for, say, if you're compressing vocals and you want to tune them, you want to keep that noise floor as low as possible. So uh, by not compressing it before it hits the tuner, that keeps the noise floor lower, so then your like electric guitar solo for, through a loud amp doesn't trigger the tuning program and make it push a pitch in the wrong direction, and that's that's just ugly. You don't want to deal with that. So, um, 
So we, we have our digital send option to pre, and we've got our digital send source to analog. We want to do that on all of our channels. So that is step one. Now that we've done that, I've got a, say, a scene that I have on here that has all that done, or at least it should. We're going to hit recall, and that should have all my channels doing it the right way now. Yep, all of it's going the right way. So that's a happy time. Now let's switch over to the computer and see what we need to do over there. So I'm going to switch over to Studio One so you guys can see that. And over in Studio One, let me pull up my window. In Studio One, now I'm going to, I've got a session up already, but I'm going to show you how to create a new session. I'm going to make a new song and on Interface, and I apologize for being off mic while I do this, so hopefully you guys can hear me fine. We're going to create a new session. We're going to stroll down here. I have a Studio Live 32. So if my eyes would work and I could see Studio Live 32 session. You want to save it in the right place because saving in the right place is fun. Uh, but for this, I'm just showing you how you, you know, open it up. We're going to hit OK. Now we're loading this new scene and we've got all of these and it's got 32 channels uh, ready to go. Uh, channel 1, and if we expand this a little bit, you can see that channel 1 is the input and channel 1 is the output. So then, if we also click this, we can add our inserts here and we can do, you know, whatever we want plugin-wise on this. And the plugin windows aren't showing up on this. I apologize. So we've got our plugins here, and I'm sorry that my OBS is not showing that pop-up window. Uh, but we can add plugins here. Now, there are a couple special considerations uh, if we want to have stereo channels. And this is a Studio One specific thing. Um, but we're going to... Um, we're going to make it so that we can use stereo channels. Studio One can group channels, but having it group the stereo channels is not exactly the same. It doesn't allow you to... to change the plugin parameters themselves at the same time. So what we're going to do is we're going to create some stereo channels, but we're also going to create some stereo IO uh, because in order for a stereo channel to look at a stereo input, it can't just like input two mono inputs. We're going to have to do that. Um, and I realize this probably isn't going to pop up the way that I've got OBS looking at Windows. Nope, it's not showing. So. The short story is, I should have tested a little bit more. The long story is, uh, what you're going to have to do is create more stereo inputs and outputs for all the stereo channels that you want. So on this session, uh, I'll let you take a look over here. I've got stereo overheads. I've got stereo drum pads. I've got a stereo keyboard. So I would make three stereo inputs and three stereo outputs so that when I load a plugin onto both of those, they're going to change the parameters all at the same time. Uh, checking in on the chat over here. Uh, Michael's not seeing a sync issue, so that's happy times. Um, yeah, making USB plus digital equals ouch. Yeah, don't create a digital feedback loop. Um, I should show screen sharing, but I'm not going to switch that midstream because y'all would get bored. So. Um, thank you for showing up and checking me in the chat because I need help with live streaming. Uh, so now that we've got these set up, we've got Studio One set up, right? Um, Studio One, let me load the other session that already has everything um, saved. So we're going to go to a different song. And we're going to do our start scene. So in this one, um, you know what? I am going to change this. So, excuse me a minute. I'm going to do my display capture instead. And you guys get to see my whole display. There we go. All right. Fixed it midstream. So you can see my whole display now. Uh, if we go into our options and song setup, we can see our inputs and outputs on the audio IO setup tab. 
And you can come down here and see where I made stereo inputs for 7, 8, 9, 10, and 17 and 18. And I also made stereo outputs for, you guessed it, 7, 8, 9, 10, 17, and 18. Here's the trick though. I wanted to have stereo returns for trigger two because I want to have drum triggers and I want them to be stereo because that's what I like. So I also made another pair of stereo outputs that didn't necessarily need stereo inputs for 25, 26, and 27, 28. I'll show you how to arrange those on the console later. Um, so that's another thing that I'm doing. I'm going ahead and creating those in my output IO page so that I can do that. So I'm gonna hit okay here, showed you how I did that. Now I'm gonna unhide these channels that I already made, right? So over here I've got kick trigger and I've got snare trigger. So these have the inputs. So kick trigger has the same input as the kick channel, but its output is on 25 and 26. That way I've got a separate stereo output for that and it's on its own faders and it's got all their like reverb and stuff that's built into the channel in stereo. So it's kind of fun. Uh, same thing for the snare channel. It's in 27 and 28. So now when I add these inserts and I type in trigger, I can load this up and we're getting a little bit specific into trigger, but this could work for Drumagog. It could work for any other uh, program that you're using to um, to add a sample, whatever you want to do. But specifically in trigger, you probably want to be in low latency mode. Now, you could probably get away with more latency, and we're going to talk about latency in just a little bit, uh, because it is a problem that you have to overcome. It's not impossible, but we we want to keep the latency as low as possible, right? A lot of these plugins only use one or two samples, and so you don't have to deal with a lot of latency. You can even not latency compensate for many of your channels, and you'll be fine, right? So. If you want to nerd shame me and say that everything has to be exactly sample, you know, perfect, you can do that and I will accept that nerd shaming. Um, however, most of the time you can get away with it and it's not a big deal. But we still want to keep low latency. So in our settings, we are going to choose latency live mode. Now, if you're switching from low or normal latency mode, uh, you have to close and then reopen the plugin in order for it to operate in that mode and for the automatic delay compensation to properly adjust for that as well. So you might have to close and reopen it. Um, also, we're going to go ahead and just go to our browser and select the kick drum sample. Um, and then on our snare drum, we're going to do the same thing. And but we're going to choose a snare drum sample. I don't even know what the snare drum sounds like, but it matches, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. So we've got our drum samples, and we've got our uh, things going on. Uh, what else do we need to look at? If we look at our vocals over here, I've already got all these labeled, and it's just take the time and label it. It's worth it. Uh, we can add waves to in real time. Uh, if you highlight all of them at once, oops, you can load the plugin all at the same time. Uh, Ta-da! And they're loaded. Um, now, like I said, grouping them together doesn't change the way that the plugin parameters change, which is kind of a bummer, but... Um, there's another way to use scenes or snapshots to change like how you load each key if you're going to change keys and put it in you know major mode. The vocals that I'm going to be running through here today are already tuned, so I'm just doing this for purposes to show you guys. Um, so I'm not actually changing it from chromatic to major and picking a key. And I don't even remember what the key is on this song. Um, so we've got our triggers. We've got that, and we can load up whatever other plugins we want, right? So imagine on the bass, we want to load our bass, right? So we go here, um, we load up our bass, and we've got our bass ready to go. We pull back the intensity a little bit because all the way at zero is a bit much to start. Um, there's a there's plenty of other plugins we can try and use while we're doing this. Um, 
So, checking in the comments. Uh, do, 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 do. Well, we got some good uh, feedback coming from people in the comments. With Slate triggered, do you send the replacement sample to your drummer in his or her in-ear mix? Uh, I don't want to send anything that's any later than it has to be, so I usually don't send an extra um, anything returned to the in-ear mix. Um, but we'll talk about monitoring in just a minute because there's some things we've got to deal with, and I'll talk to you specifically about singers and show you how to do that. But if I'm returning plugins and there's any latency at all, I'm going to try to have the monitoring system totally separate, and I'll show you how you can do that if you've got enough channels to duplicate uh, things like that. So here we are. We've got this. We've got the plugins loaded. I'm just going to load another session that already has my plugins all loaded that I did earlier. So here we go. Now we've got another session. And you can see I added Trigger 2. I did the CLA 76 on the kick and the snare samples because it sounds awesome. And I put our bass on the kick drum sample because that's awesome too. Uh, the SPDs I've added Vitamin because that's fun. I'll let you guys listen to that. And our bass on the bass. So just a few little things. Now, another fun thing about the way that Studio One and the Studio Live work together is that you can even control the console's processing from your computer. If I double click in the right place, you can go to the fat channel. And now the stuff that we mess with over here, let's see what channel am I on? I'm on Tom One. So we can see here the top end is flat. We can see on the console, if I go to Tom One, the top end is flat. Hopefully you can see that. Now I, on the computer, I can you know boost that shelf a bunch. And hopefully you can see over here, the boost happened over there. Now remember this processing is after the processing from the computer, even though it's at the top of the channel strip here, it's still going to be after what returns to the console because of the way that we got it. Um, so back in Studio One, that's lots of fun. Now I actually have live, I'm not just like showing you what to do. Let's actually play live tracks through it and see what we do. But wait, we've got latency. I'm going to show you where to look in Studio One to find your latency. Uh, down here in the bottom left corner, uh, you can see where it shows your sample rate. Right below that, there's a number in milliseconds. And if you hover over it, it says total plug-in delay. So of all the plugins that you have loaded in your entire session, this is the total amount of delay that the plugins are creating. So this is the total amount for plugin delay compensation. Because we've got Trigger 2 in live mode, it's only four milliseconds, which is awesome. Four milliseconds is little enough that most people in the audience won't be able to tell the difference, right? Um, might your musicians be able to tell the difference in their monitors? Maybe. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. So, so when you have that latency, you're going to have to compensate for it. And let's go back to the console and show you what to do there. On the console, on your input channels, we've got input delay. And so we want to match all the channels that aren't uh, having these delay causing plugins uh, to be delayed by the same amount that the plugins are causing latency. So on all my dry drum channels, I'm going to delay those by four milliseconds. I can delay everything else by four milliseconds too. That make, might make the band feel a little bit tighter, all right? So, so we're going to go here and we're going to turn our input delay up to four milliseconds. Now doing this with a rotary encoder is not very fun. So let's go over to universal control and make that window bigger. Please excuse me. So now that we're in universal control, we can select any of these channels and we can just type in the delay amount. Uh, where are we? Aha, uh -huh, delay. So here I would type in four milliseconds and the next channel, four milliseconds. And we do that over and over and over again, but I don't want to do that. So I'm going to recall a scene. Uh, where are we? So I've got this programmed already so that all the channels except for the 
drum trigger return channels are hitting uh, four milliseconds. So I'm going to recall this one. And now all my settings have changed to that. So if I go back over here, you can see everybody's got four milliseconds of delay. Except for, if I scroll down here, I've got my kick trigger and snare trigger returns. These don't have any delay on them. So that's how we keep everything time aligned. If this is making sense so far and you're watching in the replay, go ahead and type delay in the comments below. If you're watching live, give me that thumbs up so that I know that you're, uh, you're following me so far. And if you're totally lost and you hate everything that I'm saying, go ahead and hit that thumbs down and I'll take it like a man. Uh, so, uh, here we go. Now, let's get into what we're going to do. Well, we can listen to it. Do you want to hear what it's like with drum triggers and with not? I also created a custom layer so that I've got my drum triggers right beside my drums. So, that's kind of fun too. Let's check that out. Uh, console overhead. Here's the song. It's coming from my uh, Cymatic Audio U-Track 24. So, I've actually got analog inputs going into the console. That's, uh, that's my fun way of simulating having a live band without having a live band. Oh, and I forgot, don't shame me if the music level is not perfect with my mic level because it's hard enough to do that live when you're not the talent. So uh, it's just, you know, yeah. If you can't hear it perfectly, I apologize. You might have to adjust your volume a little bit. But here's your disclaimer. The other disclaimer is that if you're listening in HD, you will hear the sparkle on the drums a little bit more. And you won't hear those nasty digital artifacts if you're streaming in 320 because sometimes that's what YouTube uh, defaults to when you're watching something live. So you can go ahead and change from 320 to whatever HD. Make sure it says HD so that you can get all that audio goodness and you can hear the beauty of these samples. So, here we go. For the Lord our God, he reigns. He reigns. Now, uh, here we can see, you can see that I've got my user layer, so that I've got my kick drum and my snare drum and my snare bottom, but I've got my kick trigger, one of the sides, and my snare trigger, one of the sides, here on that same layer. So they're together, even though my normal inputs, they don't show up until over here. So that's my little trick for getting it all worked out so that I don't have to rearrange everything just to put my kick and snare triggers together. So here we go. Lord our God, yes you reign. Let's declare you reign, you reign, you reign. So these are my... Uh, my live inputs, like the, the actual microphones coming back, and you'll be able to listen to that. All right, not bad, but there's room for improvement, so let's listen to what it's like with the triggers instead. So that's pretty fun that we can do all that while we're live, right? We can use those samples and there's only a little minuscule, uh, you know, timing difference uh, from going all the way around trip for, to the computer and back. And that's lots of fun. Um, so, um, Michael asks, if you have if you have all of your channels going through the digital audio workstation and then coming back, do you have to delay the ones coming that are on the console? And the answer is, it depends. Uh, there are some plugin hosts that will uh, delay compensate everything, right? Even in live input mode. But most of the time, most of your digital audio workstations in live input mode are not compensating for the plugin delay. 
Now, there could be an update that comes out that proves me wrong, and I have been wrong before, and I'm happy to eat my words and update you in the, in the description below. Uh, but as it stands right now, most of your workstations are not going to delay compensate for your plugins while you're in live input mode, and that's what you have to be in. Another thing that I'm going to show you that it set up for me automatically when I loaded this session, uh, but I want to make sure that you see it, uh, is here in Studio One, things are record ready and they're in monitor input mode. So you can see, you know, that is lit up and this blue button is lit up. If that's not, you won't be able to hear anything through it, even though it's getting to the computer. So you've got to make sure that that is on as well. Um, yes, I give it depends answers because there's no cut and dry thing. Um, thank you, Conrad, calling me out on it depends. I'll have to circle back to you. Um, but I do know what I'm talking about. So, um, that's a lot of fun, right? We get to use samples live and it doesn't create a whole lot of problems. You could probably even do this with a laptop. Now I haven't whipped out my MacBook Air and loaded up all these plugins and samples to see if it'll do it. Cause I've got a 2015 MacBook Air that I use for like word processing, right? I don't know if it would handle this, but it probably could. And you'd be in good shape uh, if you did it. Um, so, Here's where things get a little bit more complicated, right? Right now, I'm only using one plugin that's generating enough delay to really matter, right? So uh, let's look back, uh, let's get it, let's open it up and get complicated, okay? Because I, you know, you're gonna, if you're pushing the boundaries with plugins, you're gonna try something more complicated than this. I know it, it's because it's in your blood, it's in your DNA, the way that you like to push the boundaries. I get it, I'm there too. So, let me take a sip of tea. What do you do if you've got multiple plugins that are causing delay, and some of them are causing more delay than others? Um, so, back here in Studio One, I've got a pretty standard or not too complicated setup, right? Trigger is my main plugin that is causing delay, comp or delay and you're getting delay compensation issues. Uh, let me hit stop on that recorder. So if I turn off this, these two trigger plugins, we can see down here our total plugin delay went down to zero milliseconds. Um, so that is our main plugin that's causing the most delay. But let's say I got a little crazy and I just love tape saturation plugins, right? And I, I do love tape saturation plugins. There's no lie about that. But let's say I uh, I like Isotope Ozone's vintage tape, but it causes a lot of latency, which it kind of has to to look ahead to catch those trains against the beautiful way that it does. But look here, our delay now went up to 50 milliseconds. Now, might this be a problem if you're in a live situation? Maybe. Uh, but it also could be, uh, but if you're in a broadcast situation and you're wanting to use plugins, you can do that too. And that's totally fine. Um, you're not going to have any big problems if your total latency is 50 milliseconds. I'm having to delay my audio going to you guys by 300 or 400 milliseconds. So I've, you've got some wiggle room to let the video catch up because sometimes video just takes a bit, little bit longer to get through there. Right? So now that I've got my overheads are causing 50 milliseconds of delay. I've got the rest of my channels that I need to delay by 50 milliseconds. But if I put trigger back on here and I turn that on, the total delay is still only 50 milliseconds because this one is causing the delay, most of it, not trigger anymore. So now all of my inputs that don't have plugins that are causing much delay, I need to delay by 50.5 milliseconds or whatever that is. The ones that are causing delay, so on trigger, they're the trigger returns, I'm gonna delay those by 50 milliseconds minus the four milliseconds that they're causing, so I'm gonna delay those by 46 milliseconds. Now, so you're gonna take the longest delay causing plugin and then subtract the ones that are causing some delay by that. Now, Studio One makes it a little easier to see which plugins are causing the delay, but you turn them on and off, 
and you see this number change, right? So if I turn this one off, now it goes back down to four. So I can kind of troubleshoot and figure out what plugins are causing what delay. If you're using something like uh, Live Professor, which I really like, it will show you the total delay for that total chain on each channel. So then even within that, you can like group different channels and it will group, say all your drums together and create all that um, delay compensation for those channels uh, as a group. I know Waves uh, Super Rack will do that as well for you where you can group channels and make their delays uh, similar. Um, so that's how you get a little bit more complex and funky with your delay compensation. Then those numbers you would have to put back on the board, right? So that's where you're compensating for it. Now the, the weird thing is, um, if you're doing virtual sound check, and now again, this is another it depends thing. If you're doing virtual sound check and you've recorded all your stuff, now when you hit play and then Studio One is going to be playing back everything, but it's going to time align everything. So all that work you did time aligning everything over here, you've got to undo. But there's a trick for that. Uh, let me see if I can find it in Universal Control. You might have to create uh, another snapshot and then only recall the delay settings. So uh, I'm going to show you on the console itself. So over here on the console, if we go to scenes and let's say that I wanted to uh, recall inserts delay and delay by four milliseconds and I want to do that and I'm going to recall that, that's fine. But if I want to go back to only the one that has the routing, but I know doesn't have any input channel delay on it, I can select this scene and then hit filters. And then all, all of these are only recall filters. They're not save filters, right? But if I deselect all of these except for recall channel delay and I hit recall, now it should be that all of these channel delays, did you do it? Let's see. Uh, now the channel input delay is back down to zero. You probably can't see it on your screen, but you're gonna have to trust me on this one. Uh, that's what it says regardless of, uh, you know, what else is going on. So, uh, da -da -da. I'm trying to read comments really fast. Um, Yep, I think I'm covering all this. So, oh, okay. So back to my, or my other point that I was talking about is, so you either can change the delay coming back in on your console, or you could do it the uh, production online way, with, but I'm not going to get into that. Just do it this way if you've got a Studio Live console and have that recall filter available. But don't forget that you hit that recall filter and unselected all of those for the next time you go uh, to recall a scene and a snapshot because you'll be like, where's all my settings? And then they're all gone because, or you think they're all gone because you didn't actually tell the console to recall all of them. So you can recall either just the delay stuff or uh, on one session or another. And you can even save those as their own thing. So uh, let me check my notes here. Okay, we've time aligned everything. Now we're going to talk about separate singer returns or what we're going to do with monitors, right? So I do not like, as a rule, to send singers tuned vocals because they need to be able to hear themselves really well in all of their whatever so that they adjust and try to get to the center of the pitch the most themselves, right? Because if they hear themselves one way in their head, like through their bones and one way through their in-ears, they're going to think like, what's going on here? Going to be confused, right? They won't shift the pitch closer to the center if they already hear that they're on the center in their in-ears, right? So I, I want to keep those separate. Now, one selling point for the, six, the Studio Live 64 is that you get 64 channels so that you can totally duplicate all of your channels, one through 32, and have all of them separate for the monitor. So they're using the same preamp, but
but they've got completely separate uh, processing available for monitors versus front of house or monitors versus broadcast. That is a really cool thing that you can do. Um, but you don't always have all of that. So maybe you just want to return your singers to several uh, different channels, right? So you have one set of singer inputs that are straight from the analog uh, preamp. They're not coming back from the computer. You've got another set that is coming back from the computer so that you can mix them your, your way, you know, like you can have it your way, but don't get crazy. Um, but they can also hear it plain Jane. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in Studio One. So over here in Studio One, I could set it up. Where's my mouse? Here we go. Over here in Studio One, I could set up these singers so that instead of 19, 20, and 21, I could have them come back 22, 23, and 24. Now, I've got a scene for this as well. Uh, scenes, singer return, and turn on all my filters. Now I hit recall on that. And now I've got channels on my first layer where I've got tuned return. So I've got my singers here. Most of the time I'm gonna keep these down and mix with these, but these ones are the ones that I would send to the monitors or route to their monitor mix, right? Uh, also, if things crash, uh, you can quickly get the vocals back up if you have these safety channels, which is why I like to duplicate them anytime we're running to a computer and back, right? Uh, I just don't trust it, right? I mean, I, I like it and I think it's great, but computers do crash and fail and I never want to be in a situation where nobody can hear what somebody's singing because the computer crashed, right? So that is how you set all that stuff up. Uh, checking the chat. Man, I'm so glad you guys are hanging out in the chat and talking to each other. This is fun. Um, so... Yeah, I'll buy a 64 tomorrow. Cool. Uh, Faroe Islands. Never been there. Uh, what's up, Ragnar? Uh, Joe Foldy, Peter. Uh, very cool. Glad to have you guys here. Uh, if you guys don't have any other questions, I'm going to be signing off for today. If you are new here and you still haven't subscribed, or if you've been watching my stuff and you just, you just resist the urge to click that bright red button, and to bash that bell so that you know exactly when I'm going live. It's not a surprise, or it is a surprise, but you don't hear about it later and get that fear of missing out. You should subscribe and ding the little bell. I'm so glad to be serving you guys. Remember, avoid the sound tech solo. It's all about the low end, and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum, no matter how awesome your sample sounds. So, until next time, thanks for showing up, and we will see you guys back here on the next episode of...